everyone. I am so proud and privileged tonight to introduce Brad Dickerson, the director of the MGH Frontal Temporal Disorders Unit and Neuroimaging Lab in Boston. He is also a staff behavioral neurologist. Yeah, a round of applause for Brad. Don't hold back. Even with your sneakers and your crutch, you just got a whistle. I love it. <laughs> and he is also a staff behavioral neurologist in the MGH Memory Disorders Unit and co-investigator of the Neuroimaging Core of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. He's an associate professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Dickerson runs a busy weekly clinic caring for patients with various forms of cognitive impairment and dementia, as well as providing training for clinical and research fellows. His research employs quantitative structural, functional, and molecular neuroimaging techniques to investigate dementias as well as normal aging. He has published more than 100 articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals, as well as many book chapters, and has edited two books on dementia. He's won a number of awards, including the American Academy of Neurology's Norman Geshwin Award in Behavioral Neurology. But you know, Brad is not so different from us. So, about a week ago, we received a gift for $1,000 on our gala fundraising website, and it came with this beautiful comment. My son, Brad Dickerson, devotes his entire life to this cause, and I'm very proud of him and his great work. Janae Dickerson, Brad's mom. So, I, re I reached out to Brad's mom, and I told her, I said, you know, I'm going to be talking about my mom in my remarks, and talking about how she, you know, prepared me for the future. She had all of this confidence in me, and she did things for me to get me ready for the future. And, you know, do you have any pictures of yourself with Brad, or did you do anything to get him ready to be a doctor. So she wrote me back a long email, which was great. And she sent me these two photos in particular that I thought were really amazing. So Mrs. Dickerson sent, the first one is a picture of Brad and his mom when he was about five months old. And the second picture is of Brad with his grandmother and his great-grandmother. Now, shortly before our evening began, I checked in with Dr. Berger, Dr. Dickerson's wife, and she let me know that technically it would be grandma and more grandma. Because we didn't, we didn't want to have grandma and old grandma. So it's grandma and more grandma. And Mrs. Dickerson told me a story about how one time when Brad was four years old, he was in his grandmother's dress shop and a, a customer who happened to be a nurse was observing Brad and pointed at him and said, that boy is going to be a doctor. Brad, do you remember? No? But I just want to say that we all came from somewhere. We all have benefited from the support of people who loved us. And we're so thankful for everything that Mrs. Dickerson did to get us to this moment today. Brad, welcome to the stage. <laughs> Thank you so much, Katie. I am once again blown away by the way you deliver these incredibly powerful human messages. And uh, you know, I, that 
I knew you said you were going to surprise me. Where, where'd you go? Over there, yeah. But I had no idea. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, I've told the story many times tonight about this, uh, but I started out trying to tell people that I had this terrible drumming accident. I was playing my drums and my foot went through the bass drum and the cymbal fell down and smashed it. But people didn't really believe that, so um, I have to resort to the real story, which is that I, was, uh, I had left my Superman cape at home on this fateful Sunday when my daughters asked me to jump on these little platform things at the playground that happened to have springs underneath them that are strong enough to support about a 100-pound kid, up, up to about a 100-pound kid, but sadly, I'm a little bit beyond that. So down I went, and my family had to rescue me and a bunch of friends, and my wife, Allison, had to take me to the emergency room, and I had a small fracture and a bad sprain, and so it's recovering well, but uh, thanks to all of you for your sympathy, and it's been a real uh, uh, enlightening experience uh, because I couldn't drive for a month and uh, now I think I have a little better appreciation for some of what many of you have to deal with. So I want to just start out by, by thanking Alison Berger, my wife, for her uh, unwavering support and faith in me and in the work that we do. Thank you, honey. I love you. And then I have a bunch of people to thank for tonight before I get into the presentation, so bear with me, please. Uh, I want to start by thanking also Merit Sakovich for coming tonight and opening the ceremonies and for all your support at the uh, Department of Neurology and beyond. Uh, I think your efforts have really transformed uh, the department and the relationships with many other departments and continue to make MGH the wonderful place to work that you talked about from your own experience. So thank you so much. I, I have the honor to have been introduced by my um, colleague and mentor, Dr. Bruce Price, to uh, a wonderful family, um, Lee and Laura Rickles and Liz and George Krupp. Uh, thank you guys so much for your faith and support and your uh, enthusiastic participation uh, and, and uh, the, the real gift that you gave to uh, get this program going beyond what it was uh, when you came along. So thank you so much for everything. I wish I would have had a chance to meet Tom Rickles, but I'm honored to hold a chair in his name. I want to really uh, thank Shirley Gordon also, and Mike and the crew over here for coming down, the Easter Seals FTD support group members. I think uh, they're emblematic of what many of you are doing here tonight, which is uh, really going out of your way and putting a lot of effort into being here uh, and to be inclusive and to bring people with the illness along with people who are uh, family members of people with these illnesses to participate in the event tonight. So thank you for all the effort that it takes to do that. And I'm truly inspired by the artistry uh, that really inspires this whole evening and, and the art show this evening that we saw down the hall. Uh, thank you to all the artists for contributing the work to the evening and for really giving us uh, uh, that, the, the kind of inspiration that you can only get from that kind of artwork that goes beyond words. So thank you for your participation tonight. And I want to thank um, the families that are sponsors, family bronze sponsors, including the Almeida family, the Kearney family, the Landau family, and the Sermos family. The silver sponsors, uh, Krupp family, Riley Electrical Contractors, facilitated by, by the wonderful Wendy Newcomb, and the Salmonson family. And there's a very, uh, another very special family and friend network that is here tonight, which is the uh, family of the, the um, uh, 
beautiful Francine Fluke. And I really want to express special appreciation to the Fluke family and the friends that, that came, 27 guests uh, in memory of Francine, who uh, along with many other good people, we have lost to these illnesses just in the past year. So I want this night to be in memory of uh, the good people that we've lost in this fight and the people that have stood with them to battle these diseases. So thank you. So now I want to just tell you a little bit about what inspires us in our work. Um, in 2007, I had the great fortune to be introduced by one of my best friends, Lee Hochberg, uh, to now Daisy Hochberg, um, before they got married. And when Allison and I um, met Daisy, when Lee brought her over to visit, we said, wow, this, this seems like the real thing. We're so excited. And Lee said, hey, and by the way, can I talk to you about a little work opportunity that I have been hatching in my mind for Daisy? Because she's a speech pathologist um, and really would like to work with adults. Um, you know, loves kids, of course, but, but doesn't, would, would like to work with adults with the kinds of problems that you're working on. And so, uh, Daisy and I started this amazing journey together in 2007 where um, she helped me start the primary progressive aphasia program and it evolved to become the frontal temporal disorders unit and last year we celebrated our 10th anniversary of the program and, and so uh, thank you so much Daisy for your inspiration in getting things started. And, and I also want to say thank you to uh, now the team has grown and, and your program book has um, uh, brief bios and pictures of many of the members of our team. And I can't thank you enough for your dedicated, passionate efforts to uh, care for people with these illnesses and to do the research that we're doing to try to change the future. So thank you to the FTD unit team. We, we can't do this without partnerships. As Katie so eloquently says, we have to work together. We're, we're, we, we can make more than what each of us can do alone. Uh, and one of the first partnerships that I want to acknowledge is that with Sybil and Kimon Sermos. It was um, a, a little over four years ago now that, that you guys helped inspire the idea for the Night for the Arts with FTD. And I couldn't thank you enough, I can't thank you enough, and we've had an amazing journey thanks to your inspiration as artists in uh, bringing this into uh, the, the community efforts. So thank you to you guys. When Daisy and I started the program, uh, we recognize that we need to engage people in ways that uh, are meaningful to them and are helpful to them. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about speech and language pathology is that even when people are having trouble communicating, speech and language pathologists get in there and work with them to try to improve uh, their ability to compensate for their troubles and work with their families to try to help them communicate. So Daisy and I uh, met Katie Brandt when she brought her husband to the program. And I want to just take a moment with Daisy to, uh, to give a special acknowledgement and appreciation to Katie Brandt as one of the most amazing partners that we could have ever found in the efforts to engage the community and uh, the world. Thank you so much, Katie. Daisy had the fabulous idea uh, of giving a, a, an award, a plaque, to uh, appreciate, to express physical, physically the appreciation that, that we have. So um, Daisy's going to read the uh, inscription. Thanks, Brad. Um, so Katie, this is our first annual gala recognition award. And I'll just read the inscription. Celebrating the team member who has demonstrated long-term dedication to the scientific and clinical goals of the unit, while persevering every day in taking steps forward toward reaching these goals. This year, we honor Katie Diane Brandt, who has excelled in providing the highest quality of care, education, 
and support to our patients and families while working tirelessly in local and national communities to raise awareness and funding for these disorders. So Katie, if you wanna come on up. So, I, I, Brad just said she has to speak. I, I'm just going to say one thing. They put my whole name on this plaque, so my middle name is Diane, which is my mother's name. How'd you know? How'd you know? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I love it. I love it. Surprise. Surprise. Thank you for the idea, Daisy. That, that, it's perfect. Um, as Katie said, uh, we, we've been so honored that, that she's, been, uh, given, she's been appointed a, a seat at the table in the National Alzheimer's Project Act Advisory Council. You know, I'm going to talk about the uh, research that we're doing and the care that we're doing, but I love the fact that, that our group has representation at the national level and the issues that you are facing every day are being brought to attention. Uh, at that level, and I think Katie's the, the first to tell us all that the stories from individual people's lives are what motivate change uh, at that level. So uh, congratulations for being in that position, and we're very proud of the work that you're doing there. The mission of the FTD unit is to provide interdisciplinary care, treatment, and support to maximize patients' and families' quality of life that's really the first and foremost thing that we want to do for people. We want to also educate the current and next generation of healthcare professionals about FTD and related disorders because many of you in this room have stories about how you had to do that with your healthcare provider because they'd never heard of these things. So that's important. And then, of course, we need to pursue research to bring us closer to the cure. I'm going to just give you a little bit of highlights of all of those areas of work. This is the list, which I'm almost having trouble fitting on one slide now, of the people that we've trained or are training in speech pathology, neurology, psychiatry, uh, psychology, neuropsychology, neuroscience, even internal medicine. And these are all at the graduate and postgraduate level. There are many of people at, the, people at the student level that come through and do rotations in the lab that many of our team provide mentorship roles for, and I think as Merritt has shown us so well in our department, it's really grooming the next generation uh, of, of people that have the energy and the talent to do new things in, in these fields that we're going to ch see change continue in the future. So uh, let me just say a little bit about dementia care today. Bring their expertise to bear and often meet in small rooms that are, that are filled to the brim, as many of you have experienced, to try to help patients and families understand what's going on and for us to try to figure out more about what's going on. And, and so uh, I think that that's one of the things that is a, a special uh, thing that is a little bit different than what you sometimes experience when you go to see an individual practitioner in an office, which is important too, but I think bringing these multiple disciplines to bear uh, is important. And then uh, there are a variety of support groups and treatment groups that uh, have sprung up and that a number of you are involved in here, either facilitating or uh, participating in. But one of the ones I'm particularly proud of was, has been run by Megan Quimby, uh, our speech pathologist, and Katie Brandt, and uh, with participation of, of Bonnie Wong, our neuropsychologist, and a number of other members of our team, and really uh, showing the uh, value of uh, a multidisciplinary care and support and uh, treatment group uh, with patients and families with progressive aphasia. So that's been fabulous, and what it has led us to be able to do by collecting some data on uh, the impact of these kinds of programs is that we were able to leverage the initial pilot experience with these caregiver intervention studies that we've started just in the last few years uh, that have been supported by seed fund funds like we're raising tonight philanthropically 
to obtain a five-year National Institute on Aging funded project to study a caregiver intervention to improve decision making in advanced care planning. We just got that last month and I'm really proud to see that, that, that even at the level of studying the best forms of care that we can provide to people, we're now funded to do that in part thanks to some of the efforts of you who have participated in various ways in getting us started in that area. So thank you. It's really right at the intersection of care and research because I think we, we think we know what, what, how to care for people, but we need evidence to show that it actually makes a difference in people's lives. So what about the research cycle? I like to think about the research cycle as revolving around the patient and of course the family living with these illnesses. And I'll just hit a few highlights of the things that we're doing to go in full circle here. So we're, we start with scales to measure symptoms of these conditions. Uh, when we started doing this work in 2007, there were not many scales that could be used to measure the symptoms that you would be able to show uh, change in if you wanted to try to develop new treatments. So uh, whether you see Dr. Eldife doing a neurological exam uh, or whether you start to think about how to quantify aspects of people's movement, people's speech and language, or people's cognition, uh, we need these new scales to try to show uh, what people have trouble with now, what they're good at now, and whether certain things that we do with them can change those measurements. And uh, Daisy helped uh, me develop the progressive aphasia severity scale, or the PASS as it's called, to measure aspects of speech and language uh, to be able to show what things people are good at, what things people have trouble with when they have communication problems, and uh, to enable us to be able to use this in studies. And I'm very proud to show you the worldwide map of uh, where this scale has been uh, taken. So we get requests on a weekly basis from people all around the world and our team put together this map to just give you a sense of where uh, in, in the different continents uh, people have requested and started using this scale. So I'm very proud of the fact that we've really had worldwide influence uh, in, in helping people understand how to measure the symptoms of these illnesses. And Claire Cordella is a graduate student in speech-language pathology and, and um, uh, communication sciences technology and is developing ways to quantify what I'm doing up here, which is trying to speak fluently. Um, and so you can imagine, like with your phone, if your phone can listen to what you're saying and basically transcribe it, then we ought to have automated or semi-automated methods to help us measure when people have trouble communicating. And so uh, she and other members of our team, including Dr. Bonnie Wong, who's working on developing methods uh, that are semi-automated, novel methods uh, to measure other aspects of cognitive function, are hopefully going to take us into the next generation of how we measure people's symptoms. And ultimately, we'd like to be able to let people take devices and technology home with them so that we can have more frequent measurements of these functions in daily life, rather than just measuring them once every three or six months in the office. So it's a really exciting area of marrying technology with uh, the kinds of clinical training that it takes to be able to interpret these signals. So then what about measuring changes in brain structure and function? One of the things that's really amazing about all of these diseases, but primary progressive aphasia gives a very um, uh, specific example, is that if you look at the top of these brain images, um, the, uh, what it shows is the, the outer view of the left side of the brain and the outer view of the right side of the brain, and it shows where in most healthy people uh, the activity is when they're either uh, listening to or reading sentences and trying to understand what those sentences mean. So that's the healthy brain's language network. And then if you look at the bottom, the, the uh, same types of brain images show where there is shrinkage uh, in the brain when people have primary progressive aphasia. And what is striking is how similar those two maps are to each other. For some reason that we don't understand, these conditions can strike a specific network in the brain and lead to problems within that network and stay fairly circumscribed, at least for some period of time. And one of the things that, that uh, some of our imaging neuroscientists, including Dr. Jess Collins and Dr. Alex Tarotoglo uh, and Dr. Deepti Pusha and others are doing in our lab is looking at the healthy network, which is the top brain image that shows a different representation of the healthy language network, and then using advanced imaging technology 
uh, that can be measured with MRI or PET scans to look at reduced function, which is the blue showing not the shrinkage of the brain, but showing areas that are reduced in their function, uh, and also the, sh the, the shrinkage in, in both the gray matter and the white matter connections. So one of the things that we're very fortunate to have is a wonderful partnership with uh, the investigators and the team at the Martino Center for Biomedical Imaging. And we have a number of members of that uh, institute here. Bill Shaw and Jacob Hooker and others are here with us tonight. And we're delighted to be able to maintain this relationship because the technology that the Martino Center uh, it develops is really world-leading uh, advanced imaging technology that enables us to measure things in the brain that nobody's ever seen before and it's really a beautiful thing when you look at these things for the first time and realize wow we've never seen this in a, in a person's brain before and some of these things um, it's not so clear what they're going to tell us but other things pretty quickly become very relevant to thinking about how the brain works or what goes wrong with it when it doesn't work so Dr. Mark Eldif and uh, a team of investigators in our group are pioneering a technology called transcranial magnetic stimulation. And this is a technique to stimulate the functioning of certain parts of the brain with a very f uh, focused magnetic field that gets just applied to the outside of the skull with a, a little coil that um, is, is safe and easy to do. Uh, and what it can do, if you put this little coil, which is that little uh, uh, figure eight at the top, and you stimulate a certain part of the language network, then what you can see over time, at least at the beginning anyway, is increased connections within the language network and what may be changes in function that we hope would, uh, even if the disease continues to progress, we would hope that it would help us maintain language function for longer than would be possible otherwise. We don't yet know if it's gonna work, but we've got a grant that is uh, uh, helping us do that study right now, and we've got several other projects that are in preparation to move that forward further. So that's another exciting new technology that we're in the process of developing to try to see if it might help us understand more about the brain systems and also maybe do something to help them function better. So then uh, imaging other biomarkers uh, in, the in the molecules in the brain. So what I'm talking about so far is the structure and the function, but what we know is that the basis of many of these diseases is uh, problems in the molecules in the brain that cause the cells not to function properly. So uh, we can see the, sh the shrinkage uh, in parts of the frontal lobe, and what we want to be able to do is to say, what are the molecules that are responsible for this problem? So you can think of it sort of in an analogy to cancer, which is where you know there's a uh, tumor growing in a tissue, in, the, in an organ, in the body, but if you don't know what the molecules are in that tissue, you're not gonna be able to successfully treat it in ways that, that are targeted to the problem in that person. So it's become very clear with, with biopsies of cancers that if you do profiling of the molecules in those tumors, you can target treatment very specifically to the problems that are happening in that particular tumor. We can't biopsy people's brains in the same way that we would biopsy a, a tumor, so we use PET imaging and other kinds of um, so-called molecular biomarkers that you can measure in spinal fluid and hopefully someday in blood to try to figure out what the particular molecular problems are and someday what I hope we're able to do uh, is take, for example, the tau and amyloid uh, technology, which is uh, pretty far along in development, and say, does this person have tau positive uh, problems in their brain with amyloid negative problems? That's the kind of thing that we would see in certain types of uh, frontotemporal dementia due to tau. Or do people not have tau and they don't have amyloid, which would mean they probably have this other protein called TDP43 that we're also trying to develop markers for, but we're not so far along with yet. Or do they actually have tau and amyloid, which is what you see in people that have Alzheimer's disease, plaques and tangles in their brain, which can be at the basis of some of the conditions that look otherwise like uh, primary progressive aphasia or FTD. So this molecular profiling, we hope, will enable us to target treatments more directly at the underlying problem. And we've been developing tau PET scans, and we can see that uh, the scans in people change over time, so you can sort of get a sense that a year after the first scan, so this is a single patient scan, and on the left is the first scan, and on the right is the scan a year later, and you can see what looks like a bit of progression 
in the location and the intensity of the tau PET signal in that person's brain. And the hope would be that not only do we uh, improve our ability to diagnose at a molecular level the problem, but that we can then use the same technology to monitor the effects of treatments over time and hopefully show that they are reducing the problem. That's still a little bit in the future, but not that far in the future. It's actually happening right now in Alzheimer's, and we, we are aiming to make it happen in the frontotemporal degeneration pathologies in the not-too-distant future. So then what about laboratory models to test the underlying disease mechanisms? That what's going on at the level of the cell? And this is work that we do in partnership with Steve Haggerty and some of the other uh, scientists at the Center for Genomic Medicine, where we take, uh, I'll do a little skin biopsy in some patient's uh, arm, arms and get a little skin, and uh, the wizards in the uh, Center for Genomic Medicine uh, can reprogram those cells into stem cells and then program them to be uh, neurons, uh, brain cells that are grown in the dish. And then you can model uh, a particular human abnormality in, this, in the lab. So most of the models that we use to develop treatments and understand these mechanisms are based in uh, transgenic mice and other kinds of animals. And those take us a certain distance, but they don't take us all the way. And sometimes we see treatments fail in humans that seem to work perfectly well in mice. And so we need these models of the human disease that Dr. Haggerty and others uh, are developing to help us understand the underlying mechanisms in the cells and to ultimately be able to screen treatments. And so if you develop these models, you can screen treatments where, in this case, this is a, a photo micrograph, so a photograph that's taken with a microscope that shows you the uh, cells uh, grown in the cell culture dish um, from a human derived from their skin cells and turned into neurons in this amazing kind of science fiction that I think our artists should really help us try to depict uh, in their paintings and other work. And so on the left is a, a culture of cells grown, uh, and the orange indicates tau, problematic tau that is causing problems in the cells. And then certain kinds of drugs can be put on those uh, cells being grown. And on the right, you can see that it gets rid of the problematic tau. Now, some of those drugs we don't, haven't yet been able to figure out how to get into humans, but other drugs may be sitting on our back shelves and could be repurposed uh, and brought into studies directed at these kinds of problems. So it's really a, a new technology to help understand the mechanisms and also screen the treatments of the future. So then we take it into clinical trials, and uh, when we started the GALA um, four years ago, there really wasn't a network of centers focused on FTD and related disorders that could be prepared to do a multi-center clinical trial in a very efficient way. And one of the things that's happened over the course of the last few years is that we have a network of centers that originally came largely out of the Alzheimer's Center's networks, but now has a dedicated arm of their programs uh, that are focused on FTD. And right now we're doing natural history and biomarker studies, as they're called, following people over time and doing scans in a coordinated way across all of these centers. Uh, but we're preparing to be able to roll out drug trials or tr studies of other kinds of interventions to see if we can make a difference in people's function uh, across this network. And there's a similar network in Europe, and we're working toward efforts to try to make it be a worldwide uh, network that can do this. And I'm going to be going along with some members of our team next month to uh, Sydney, Australia, to what will be the 11th International Conference on FTD, which is really a worldwide effort to bring everybody's ideas together so that we can go back and develop more of these uh, collaborative efforts and um, uh, accelerate research more quickly. The partnerships that we have here uh, also include a caregiver conference that we have every spring where we bring uh, usually around 100 or a little more than 100 of patients and caregivers together to talk about uh, the disease, educate them, and uh, help them develop practical strategies to deal with these problems. And as Katie mentioned, there's also the partnerships with uh, biotech and uh, pharma and other rare disease organizations that take these issues to the legislative level at the state uh, and beyond so that we can figure out what's it going to take when we find a new treatment 
to get that treatment out in an affordable, accessible way when we only have a few hundred thousand people in the United States with these illnesses or with any one of these illnesses. So that, that's another challenge that we will be fortunate to have to deal with when we get to that point, but we want to be ready and we want to accelerate that process uh, at that level as well. So I really believe that through these kinds of efforts and through the engagement at a variety of different levels of you guys, and I can say that I know there are a number of people in the room that have been uh, recently in for several day long visits to do the um, very um, uh, lengthy but uh, hopefully inspiring types of scans and assessments and other tests that we do. Uh, and they're here tonight, and I want to thank you guys for taking uh, several days out of your lives to come in and, and work together with us as we fight to win the battle against these diseases. Together, I really believe we can do it, and it's not that far off. Thank you very much.